Inshallah ta'ala is there sound in the room. Does my microphone work, inshallah? Alhamdulillah. Awadu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillahi r-Rahman r-Rahim. Alhamdulillah nahmadu wa nasta'inuhu wa nastaghfir wa natubu ilayhi wa na'udhu billahi min shururi anfusina wa min sahihati amanina an yadhihilahu shuhul muttad wa man yudlil fala hadiya la wa shadu an la ilaha illallah wa hadu la shadika la wa shadu an muhammadun abduhu wa rasooluh wa khayru al-hadithi kitab Allah ta'ala wa khayru al-hadi hadi muhammadin sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa shuru al-umuri muhadathatuha wa khulu mudadatin bida'a وكل بدعة دلالة وكل دلالة في النار أما بعد Good evening brothers and sisters in Islam Friends and enemies as usual and welcome to this week's discussion inshallah ta'ala the third uh, in our series on Abu Yusuf's Kitab Al-Faraj Last week we continued uh, through what was essentially a continuation of uh, the introduction or our introduction to the treaties uh, we read through the first few pages of the introduction of Abu Yusuf rahimahullah ta'ala uh, of his work and we placed the work in its context describing that the situation of Harun al-Rashid the Khalifa whom the work was written for uh, upon his request to Abu Yusuf uh, we described the situation of the Abbasid Caliphate at that time and the efforts that it made to produce synergy or cohesion in the Ummah maintaining its control and uh, in the conscious awareness that the predecessors to the Abbasids, the Umayyads, actually lost control largely as a result of the oppressive policies of the state toward the end of their era, and largely as well as a result of their deviations from the principles associated with fiscal management of the state, uh, with the gradual removal of systems set up by the Kulaf al-Rashidin, the taxation system, the economic system was slowly over time removed, we also address the issue of taxation and governance in our contemporary world order, uh, dominated by what we term secular democracies. And we brought to light the fact that there was a massive uh, deviation uh, associated with the ideals expressed by Western norms and their practices. For example, uh, we identified freedom and capitalism as essentially only being allotted to a dominant class, despite the fact that they pretend it's for any and all. We looked for evidence uh, of that to statistics of things like the percentage and distribution of wealth uh, in the society. We also talked about institutionalized racism and the state of affairs for the African American and Spanish populations in the United States of America as an example. And we came to the conclusion that no matter the rhetoric espoused by any institution of power or body that claims authority, even those institutions that claim authority from amongst the Muslimin, that we have to scrutinize the professed rhetoric or what they say with their tongues to see if it is matched in actual application and that this was the centerpiece of being able to talk about the world uh, intellectually and academically uh, about a particular subject or topic. So, uh, we basically build up our understanding of the purpose of studying this work. Uh, Kitab al-Qaraj, the book of taxation. Its value then, and its value today. Uh, and I implore anyone that has not heard the first two segments of this discussion to listen to them. Uh, they are available uh, on revolutionmuslim.com. Uh, if indeed they desire to join us here each Sunday, inshallah ta'ala, for a continuation of this book. Uh, and from here forward, we will have a more balanced conversation, meaning... Uh, I will read from the text more. I will read from the words of Abu Yusuf rahimahullah ta'ala more and elaborate less as it unfolds. Because we have now, and it's important for those that want to engage in this discussion as we read this work, that you listen to the first two lectures because we've set forth the principles for why we are studying it, how it is valuable, and we covered a lot of the ground with regard to what was going on at the time the book was written. And so in order to understand a book of any scholarship, it's very important that we understand that all words, all fatwa, are made in the context of things that are occurring. And if we do not understand a particular fatwa in the context of the historical occurrence, then we miss out on understanding uh, a thorough uh, grasp of why things were said that were said. So we 
begin to appreciate the world more when we can understand works of academic quality, especially the books of the ulama, uh, especially those that are qualified, the mujtahid, uh, that are qualified to make ijtihad, uh, that are qualified to think for themselves. If we know the context in which Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah ta'ala, in it, for example, is writing, then it makes the book all the more valuable. And we talked a lot in our earlier two discussions about how this book by Abu Yusuf, rahimahullah ta'ala, was written in a time when the Abbasids were experiencing the early threats of decline similar to the decline that set in the Umayyads who they had taken over for. And we talked a lot about how the obligation falls upon the ulama to constantly call to the Sunnah but that the Prophet sallallahu commanded that we adhere to his Sunnah and the way of the Qulaf al-Rashidin. So when Harun al-Rashid requested that Abu Yusuf rahimahullah ta'ala write this book, this is exactly what Abu Yusuf rahimahullah ta'ala did. He combined the sunnah and what was narrated from the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam himself, but he also showed how those statements, how the hadith and the Qur'an were utilized by the Qurufa Rashidin. And it is a historical work as much as it is a book of fiqh and a book of narrations, athar and hadith. This is what makes it a beautiful book in that it preserved the system of the Khulifa Rashidin for taxation, which has a great deal to do with those that are concerned with witnessing not only the individual aspects of Islam established in the dunya today, but also giving with their life in efforts and sacrifices in order to establish the Islamic State, inshallah ta'ala. And this is important to have these ideas become commonly known so that when, inshallah ta'ala, we see that the black flag is raised in a position where it is safe, where it is secure, and where hijra is made possible to go live under the sharia of Allah Azza wa Jal, that we are educated so that we have something to offer to that state, so that we have something to bring to that state, so we have ideas, skills, and knowledge to take with us there, so that we do not become a burden on the state, so that we become an asset to the state and something and someone that can contribute to that, so that Islam, as we talked about, if you listen to the first lecture, when it is established, it spreads like wildfire. According to our scholars and to theirs, there is no greater ideological spread in the physical arena of the world than the religion of Islam and its history. And so we pray that Allah Azza wa Jal allows us to witness the renaissance of Islam, the revival of the jihad, and the victory of the jihad, so that then this Islam can be established in the earth and that we can rid ourselves of the death of Jahiliyyah, which is the death promised by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to anyone who dies a death without bayah to an emir. And so we say that this is exactly why. So if you listen to the first two lectures, inshallah ta'ala, and you join us here on Sundays after Sheikh Faisal gets done with his talks here, we will continue to cover these topics as we read through the book. <coughs> Today, inshallah, we will work through uh, the introduction uh, that we started last week uh, by discussing how Abu Yusuf rahimahullah ta'ala addressed the methodology he was using, a transmission of the historical practices of the early Islamic State under the Khulafa Rashidin, and an elaboration explaining clearly everything the Caliph would have to know to return the legislative practices to those developed by the rightly guided Khulafa. We ended by reading the statement of Abu Yusuf uh, saying, quote, Allah, out of his magnanimity, magnanimity, excuse me, and mercy, has made the men in power his vice chairments on his earth, his kulafa on his earth, and has made for them a light which illuminates the dark aspects of their relations with their subjects and would make clear whatever is doubtful with regard to their rights. The illumination of the right of the men in rule aims at the establishment of the limits set by Allah and paying rights to the people who deserve on the basis of witness and clear decision and the revival of the paths which the virtuous people have shown, the revival of the practices which the righteous personages have established orientation of these noble ways of living is a goodness which is eternal and immortal 
and we described the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that said that we are able to be immortal and earn good deeds if we leave behind us righteous children that make dua, or if we establish in the earth books whereby or knowledge that is left behind that can, the people continue to gain a benefit from, or if we establish fountains or walks charitable institutions, something that we leave behind that people continue to gain charity from when we leave. And we establish the fact that these three things, raising of the children, learning of knowledge and transmitting it and leaving behind knowledge that can be utilized after our deaths and building legacies with our lives, institutions, organizations, authentic Tawheed, for example, an organization that will, inshallah, even if the sisters that are admining the room you know, Allah Ta'ala uh, give them long life. But even if they were to pass away, it would continue to bring them a benefit for having worked so hard to establish it, you know. And so this is the way that human beings are immortal and eternal in the religion of Islam and that the deeds that we do and the things that we leave behind us continue to benefit us even after our death. <laughs> Abu Yusuf continues that the injustice of the ruler is death or annihilation for his subjects and is seeking help from those who are unreliable and devoid of any virtue is annihilation of the general public. O Amir the Mukminin, complete therefore, seek the accomplishment of blessings conferred upon you through making best use of them and seek increment in them by thanksgiving for them. Verily Allah the Blessed and Exalted says in his great book, if you would be grateful, I shall give you increment. And if you are ungrateful, then my punishment is severe. Nothing is more beloved to Allah than reformation, than islah. And nothing is more hateful to him than corruption or fasad. Commission of sins is ungra ungratitude of the blessings. It has been very rare that a people has an ungrateful attitude to the blessing and then has not returned in repentance, and their honor is not snatched away, and Allah does not let their enemy overpower them. And I pray to Allah, O Amir al-Mukminin, who has done great favors to you, that you may have the cognizance of the matters entrusted to you. He may not entrust you to yourself, and may make you his friend. He was friendly to his saints and friends. The fact is that he alone is the protecting friend, and to him you should return. So Abu Yusuf Rahimahullah Ta'ala says, nothing is more beloved to Allah than reformation and nothing is more hateful to him than corruption. The word we use for reform is used I think eight or nine times in the, uh, in the Quran uh, and in Arabic we say Islah and the word for corruption is Fasad. So Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says in the Quran do not obey the transgressors uh, those who spread corruption from fasad and reform and do not reform, reform not, right? And in many places, Allah uses the terms for islah or fasad uh, and derivatives of them, meaning verb forms. Uh, in the Arabic, there's ten different verb forms and structures, all of which change the meaning. And there's many derivatives of utilizing these terms in the Quran to describe the nature of the Muslim, any Muslim, and the purpose that his or her social engagement or interaction with our society is always being to reform it for Islam or to improve the conditions of an astray people. So Abu Yusuf rahimahullah ta'ala is alluding to this distinction here in the beginning as he's writing to Harun al-Rashid. And he does so in a manner consistent with reminding the Talif of the true purpose of existence and letting him know of the punishment for the ungrateful. In the Quran, in Surah Al-A'raf, Allah Ta'ala gives us perhaps our best example of this, the long series of ayats uh, toward the end of Surah Al-A'raf uh, describe the condition of the people of Banu Israel, or the Jews that came before us. And it is the part where uh, it describes in the Quran first the manipulation that the people of Banu Israel engaged in with regard to catching fish on the Sabbath, and how they would put the nets down into the water, and they would wait, the fish would be in the net, actually captured, but they wouldn't pull the nets 
uh, until the following day, which according to them made it halal. So they were not necessarily breaking the Sharia, they were looking to find holes in it. They were looking to find, flaw, not flaws in it, but ways to get around the Sharia of Allah as the Wajal. And for this, um, uh, Allah as the Wajal, we know, uh, rescued the people that were doing what? That were telling them this was wrong, that were commanding the good and forbidding the evil. And then he punished and turned into apes and swine those that did not do good. But the most important part that Muslims should, it's an amazing part in the Arabia. It, it, it truly is amazing. But after that sto story is over, Allah as the Wajal describes that as a result of this attitude that grew common from amongst the people. And we know that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, you will follow them directly into the lizard hole. And the Sahaba, they asked, who do you mean by them, the Jews and the Christians? And he said, who else? That we will repeat the mistakes that they made. Right, that we will engage in the same sort of deviations. People from this ummah will imitate the Yahud. Right? Will imitate the, 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 the Christian. And follow them step by step right into the wizard hole. Follow them, and them even though Allah Azza wa Jal has given us warnings. So Allah goes on uh, in, the, in the surah to describe that as a result that they would find themselves dispersed throughout the land. That they would find themselves scattered. And indeed this was their condition after the conquering of Jerusalem, and actually the Quran says they'll be cast out twice, which is perfectly conducive and correct with regard to history, because after they were established by the Persians, after they were uh, cast out uh, during, the, uh, during the time of uh, their prophet Daniel, uh, and they were cast out into Babylon, they were returned by Cyrus to Jerusalem, given power over the temple again, and then in 70 AD, the Romans ransacked and cast out the Jews again, and they were then created into a diaspora. So as the Wajal says that as a, pro as a punishment, that they would be cast out. He thought it does not say that they would be poor and impoverished necessarily. So he doesn't say he's going to punish them in the dunya. In fact, if you read closely the ayah, he does suggest that not only will they be scattered, but that they will be punished, that he will punish them collectively on the day of judgment. That he will punish them on the day of, uh, of judgment, that they're True punishment is reserved for the Jannah, that which they deny. So Allah Ta'ala says, uh, we broke them up, uh, meaning Banu Israel, into sections on this earth. There are among them some that are righteous, and some that are the opposite, some that are not so righteous. We have tried them both with prosperity and adversity, in order that they might turn to us, go back to Tawheed. Right? After them succeeded an evil generation. So from amongst these, the scattering diaspora of Yahud, uh, evil generation, an evil group of leadership grew up, those that spoused the Talmud and created the Israeli state, most likely, you know, and led to the creation of the current contemporary Israeli state. They inherited the book, but they chose for themselves the vanities, the pleasures of this world, saying for excuse, everything will be forgiven for us. And this is what they espouse, that they were born into the tribe of humankind that will be forgiven no matter what it does. So it is a racial creed, right? And we see fathoms and aspects of these mentalities I want to mention inside the very ideas that plague our ability to reestablish Islam and our Sharia in our own Ummah today. And that's why we are reading from this and reminding that Abu Yusuf Taala is saying the same thing here. Uh, Allah says, Was not the covenant of the book taken from them, that they would not ascribe to Allah anything but the truth? And they study what is in the book, but best for the righteous is the home of the hereafter. Will ye not understand? And then Allah Taala says, As to those who hold fast by the book and establish regular prayer, never shall we suffer the reward of the righteous to perish. And he uses the term here, al musrihin Right? So, this is repetitive in the Qur'an, this concept of reform. And that is why you will see many of the Islamic political parties that are formulating, whether you agree with their positions, uh, whether they accept democracy or whatnot, but oftentimes in the name of the institutions, you will find the word Islam. And this is the term that Abu Yusuf is saying. Obviously, what he's doing is he's writing to Harun al-Rashid and he's informing him that it is a time for Islam, for reform, and that he is identifying the, the necessity that he must milk out the corruption. So Abu Yusuf is extending this call to Harun al-Rashid, letting him know that if he is not grateful for the large bounty, meaning the kingdom, that he has bestowed upon the caliph uh, in the earth, Allah Ta'ala will humiliate them, that he will take it away, that he will take their honor, disperse them, scatter them like the Yahud, uh, and allow an outside force to conquer them. Allah goes on in Surah Al-Araf, 
uh, describing that these circumstances of cultures and civilizations, the people and descendants of the messengers doing corrupt, will not be an excuse on the Day of Judgment for, my, for not following the revelation. So after describing the state of the Yahud, just so that people know that you cannot follow the groups that you're with or that you're born into, Allah Azawajal gives us the beautiful proof uh, that when the word drew forth from the loin of the children of Adam, from their loins, their descendants, and made them testify concerning themselves, saying, Rabikum, Am I not your Lord who cherishes and sustains you? And that every soul said, Yes, we testify this, that you are Lord, lest we should say on the day of judgment of this we were never mindful, and unless says, or lest you should say that our fathers before us may have taken false gods, but we are their descendants after them. Will you, pa will you then destroy us because of the deeds of men who were futile? So this is a proof from the Qur'an that it doesn't matter how filthy and disgusting the society you are born into is that you will be questioned because you were taken from the back of Adam. Your soul was put in front of Allah in, in the world before this one, before you were put into your mother, before you were given, your ruh was blown into your mother by the angel in the womb, that you also had an experience that is in your subconscious of verifying Allah's question to you, who is your Lord? And so that none of us can make the excuse that we didn't hear or have enough of the message of Islam given to us, that it is incumbent upon us to seek it out and study it. And this is Abu Yusuf Rahimahullah to Ali's point, that you will be called to account and he's telling the Caliph Harun al-Rashid this, and that you must remember the favor that's bestowed to you, remembering the purpose of existence, the nature of man, and that what is most important is the hereafter, that ultimately you will be judged alone, and that not any soul will have any excuse for claiming that they were only following others. That when the ruler remembers this, Allah Ta'ala will make and take for him as Allah Ta'ala's awliya, uh, his wali, his guardian. We know the hadith. Uh, I, I, I don't think I remember the exact uh, wording of it, but the servant draws the closer to Allah by doing the uh, supererogatory acts. And once he draws the close to Allah, Allah Azawajal takes him as his wali, so that he becomes the eyes with which he sees the uh, the, the uh, mouth with which he speaks, the uh, stick with which he leans, the hand with which he strikes, and the hadith goes on and continues. That those that draw closer to Allah, that Allah is and he declares war on the enemies of these people that draw close. So Abu Yusuf is encouraging Harun al-Rashid in such a prominent position to adopt this level of taqwa and remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to reform in such a productive way that these blessings that Allah takes him uh, as a wali and establishes the promises that are bestowed uh, through the sunnah uh, for people that do this. So for us, the message today must be one of facing the reality that we may be living in extremely strange times where the deen is not established, of course, uh, and the Ummah is, of course, and certainly lost very, very far away from understanding. But we must still try to embody a life, inshallah ta'ala, that calls for reform, that calls for Islam, uh, remembering that some of the prophets and messengers will have no followers on the Day of Judgment, uh, but that they will go to the Garden, uh, not for the results, but for the efforts. You know, Abu Yusuf, rahimahullah ta'ala, continues in the treatise, I have written to you whatever you had ordered me, and have explained that to you, and made clear that to you, so understand it and ponder over it, and read it repeatedly till you have remembered it. I have done my utmost for you in this regard, and I have left no stone unturned for the betterment of you and other Muslims. So it's not just for Harun al-Rashid that he's penning this book. He says here that I have left no stone unturned for the betterment of you and other Muslims, meaning that we can still benefit from it. He continues, The pleasure of Allah Ta'ala and His reward, and the fear of His punishment has always been in my view. And I hope that if you act upon what is clear in this, Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala will increase for you the reward of undoing injustice to any Muslim, or of the people with whom a treaty has been made. Your people, your, the people you rule over, uh, are a test for you. Their reformation lies in the capacity of placing positive realities over them, or on them, and the removal of oppressions and excesses by one or the other due to misunderstanding about their rights. And I have written to you good traditions, 
which contain persuasion and inducement for action in whatever you have asked me about, and which you intend to act upon if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala <coughs> wills. So may Allah ta'ala grant you succor for such things that would please him, and to bring about islah by you and at your hands, to bring about reform by you and at your hands. So he's making, essentially he's making dua for the caliphate. Abu Yusuf uh, rahimahullah ta'ala said, Yahya bin Said narrated to me from Abu, La, Abu Zubair, from Ta'us, from Mu'ad bin Jabal, who reported the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as saying, No action that a son of Adam does brings salvation from hellfire more than the remembrance of Allah. There the companion said, O Prophet of Allah, and not even the jihad in the path of Allah, he said, and not even the jihad in the path of Allah, even if you strike with your sword till it is broken, then again strike with it till it is broken. He said this three times, the excellence of jihad al-Amir al-Mu'mineen is great, and the reward for it is magnanimous. We'll talk a little bit about this narration, inshallah. We know that in the very, you know, the first hadith in uh, the uh, Sahih of Bukhari, the first hadith in Imam Nawawi's 40 hadith is on the authority of Amir al-Mu'mineen Umar bin al-Khattab radiallahu uh, anhu. And uh, that he heard the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saying that actions are but by attention and every man shall have uh, but that which he intended. Thus he whose migration was for Allah and his Messenger, his migration was for Allah and his Messenger. And he whose migration was to achieve some worldly benefit or to take some moment in marriage then uh, then his uh, migration uh, was that for which he migrated. So, the ultimate outcome of a deed, uh, uh, the servant of Allah is rewarded by what he intended. And this is related in Bukhari and Muslim, of course. So, <clears throat> thus it was narrated by Abu Harara, radiallahu anhu, that I heard the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, say, the first of the people whose case will be decided on Yom Al-Qiyamah uh, will be a man who dies as a martyr. He will be brought forth for judgment. Allah will make him know about his blessings, which he had bestowed upon him in the dunya. Uh, the man will acknowledge the blessings that Allah gave him, and then Allah will ask him, what did you do with them? And he said, he will say, I fought for your sake, in your way, until I die as a martyr. And Allah Ta'ala will remark, you are a liar. You fought so that you may be called a brave warrior. And then orders will be passed against him, so he will be dragged along on his face and cast into hell. Um, this uh, hadith is uh, reported in Sahih Muslim and uh, Nasai. Uh, I'm not sh I don't know the number, I'm sorry. Um, but the, the point is, is that here you have Abu Yusuf, uh, Rahim Allah Ta'ala, and he is narrating that the most important thing is to have dhikr, to remember Allah Ta'ala, to have taqwa, to have taqwullah. Uh, but then he says, after he completes the narration, the excellence of jihad al-Amir al-Mu'mineen is great, and the reward for it is magnanimous. So, he is essentially saying uh, that with jihad is fine, yeah, but it's important to address a caliph who has great temptation in dunya. Uh, the Prophet ﷺ said that he feared most for his ummah, the wealth that they would acquire, because it is, there's a great test in it. And Abu Yusuf is reminding the Caliph that you must have your intentions straight in Islam, that zikr is of utmost importance, because without the remembrance of Allah, then the jihad, which is the purpose of your life in action and in embodying the message of Islam, cannot be correct, unless, of course, your intentions are sincere, and intentions are sincere when there is constant remembrance that all of action, all of speech, and all of intention itself must be done for the sake of pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so, Abu Yusuf... Uh, Rahimahullah Ta'ala here is reminding uh, Harun al-Rashid of this situation. Um, and he continues, Abu Yusuf said, some of our teachers related to me from Nafi, from Ibn Umar, that Abu Bakr Sadiq, radiallahu anhum, dispatched Yazid bin Abu Sufyan, Yazid bin Abu Sufyan to Syria, that he walked along with them to see off for about two miles. They said to him, O oh, the Khalifa of the Prophet of Allah, would you not go back? And that he, 
radiallahu anhu said, No, for I have heard the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saying that he whose feet are covered with dust in the path of Allah, that Allah will save him from the hellfire. So, the next hadith, of course, that Abu Yusuf, radiallahu anhu, um, rahimallah ta'ala, excuse me, narrates here for us, is now that he has addressed the prerequisite for jihad, its success in this world and the next, being dhikr and intention, he is now addressing the importance of going out along with being a member of the jihad. So, he narrates a narration from Yamir uh, al-Mukminin, the first the caliph in Islam, uh, the second caliph in Islam, uh, Umar bin al-Khattab, anhu, where he went out um, with the Yazid bin Abu Sufyan, just in order to get the dust on his feet, uh, which Allah's Messenger وسلم, authentically narrated uh, that uh, whoever's feet are covered with that dust will be free from the fire. So he is, unlike the ulama of today, not afraid to remind the caliph of Islam that jihad is the purpose for our existence, and that any caliph that does not go out in jihad, uh, that uh, they are lacking uh, in their obligation to this ummah, and their obligation as well to the disbelievers that are living on the perimeters of uh, the Islamic State. And the only thing I can really highlight uh, is a very important part uh, that I think uh, we should take some time to cover from Sheikh Yusuf al uari who was gunned down by the soldiers uh, of uh, whom um, Sheikh uh, Salih al considers considers them to be the uh, Mujahideen of the era, the uh, soldiers of the Saudi Arabian Peninsula, uh, the Mukhabarat uh, uh, of uh, Saudi Arabia, who gunned down Sheikh Yusuf al uari who was the uh, basically an alim uh, who uh, practiced what he preached and had substantial amounts of knowledge. And he narrates in his discussion uh, called The Ruling of Jihad and Its Division, uh, he narrates that with regard to Jihad Talab, with regard to the offensive jihad, the jihad that would have been the jihad carried out by Harun al-Rashid because there was no Muslim land under occupation. In fact, they were still trying to expand against the Byzantines, that the opinions of the ulama uh, differed with regard to the minimum time limit required upon the Muslims to perform offensive jihad underneath a stable state. And he says that the first opinion is that the Ummah must go forth in at least one expedition each year to discharge the duty of jihad. So the offensive jihad is a fard kifaya, and the defensive jihad is a fard alain. So wherever Muslims are occupied today, we say it's part of line upon the Muslims there to liberate themselves. And that if they are unable to liberate it, then the obligation spreads to all of the Muslims until that land is liberated. And so we are in a situation in Iraq and Afghanistan and other states like it, where it is part of line upon the Muslims, any Muslim anywhere, to try to get to a place where they can help their brothers and sisters in jihad. But the offensive jihad has a different scenario. And uh, the offensive jihad is a far key fire. And so there is a disagreement amongst the ulama with regard to how often uh, jihad of offensive nature must be carried out. And he says that, the, Yusuf al he says that the first opinion is that the ummah must go out at least once each year, uh, that uh, any uh, more is additional. The evidence they bring for this, this is that jizya came to be taken from a disbelieving nation in exchange to fighting them as it is not permitted in the sunnah to take jizya more than once a year, and jihad can take the place of jizya, so too does the requirement of jihad become once a year. This opinion is also what the majority of scholars are upon. Imam Qurtubi said, another quote, another division of jihad is the one that is obliged upon the imam, the khalifa. He must send a group of people against the enemy at least once a year. Either he attends the expedition himself, or sends someone whom he trusts, to invite the enemy to Islam, fight them, and establish the deen over them, or take jizya from them. There is also a type of jihad which is supererogatory, and that is the type whereby the imam sends a group of people, one after the other, as different battalions to terrorize the enemy and instill fear and to show the army strength. And this is in his tafsir, Imam Qurtubi's tafsir, volume 8, page 152. The second opinion, the Sheikh says, is that it is obligatory to fight jihad against the enemy in their heartlands whenever possible, and there is no minimum requirement stipulated. Ibn Hajar commented in his staff, Fath al-Bari, 
uh, volume 6, 28, that this opinion is the stronger of the two. Imam Qurtubi said in his Tafsir, volume 8, page 141, to view the duty of jihad as being burdensome or disliking it is prohibited or haram. So, uh, and then Sheikh Yusuf Ariyari goes on to say that his opinion, uh, the second opinion, that it is obligatory to fight the jihad against the enemy in their heartlands whenever possible, is the one, of course, that he considers the most correct, and this is very uh, contradictory to what, again, we see from the people that are supposed to be the guardians of knowledge in our Ummah today, in that you will never find, for example, Israel, the flotilla, just attacked a flotilla with Muslims on board. Had we had the dignity of Islam and understood the manhaj of the Prophet Muhammad wasallam, then we would have known that this individual, that these ulama in the Muslim world would have been calling for jihad left and right, saying that it is obligatory for us to strike them back and to return. But today, under the fact that they deem us weak, under the fact that they say we are incapable, they make excuses to avoid what the Allah's Messenger has told us will lift the humiliation from us uh, in this world. So, uh, we say that the uh, burden uh, will be upon them, uh, and that uh, it is important that we work with those scholars that are not afraid to speak the truth, no matter the fact they might uh, find themselves incarcerated as a result of it. Um, Abu Yusuf, uh, Rahim Allah Ta'ala, continues in his treatise. Uh, Abu Yusuf said, Muhammad bin Ajlan related to me from Abu Hazm, from Abu Huraira, who reported the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as saying, one morning or one evening in the way of Allah is better than this world and whatever is in it. And this tradition has reached us from Maqul in explanation of the word morning and evening in the path of Allah. It is the morning or evening in which you go out yourself. It is better than this world and whatever is in it, even if you spend it but do not go out by yourself. Abu Yusuf said, Abin bin Abu Ayash related to me from Anas who re reported the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam having said whoever sends one blessing upon me Allah will send ten blessings upon him and would obliterate his ten sins. Abu Yusuf rahim Allah ta'ala said some of my teachers narrated to me from Abdurrahman bin Saib from Abdullah bin Masood who reported the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as having said Allah Tabaraka wa ta'ala has angels who are always traveling in the land conveying to me greetings from my ummah. Abu Yusuf said, Anash narrated to me from Abu Saleh, from Abu Sa'id, from the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who said, How should I feel delight while one who is to blow the trumpet has placed it at his lips, has lowered his forehead, made his ear attentive waiting when he is ordered to blow the trumpet, he said, O Prophet of Allah, what should we say then? He said, Say, Allah is sufficient for us, and He is the best guardian, and we trust in Him. He said, Yazin bin Sinanan, narrated to him from Ad uh, Allah bin Ijris, uh, Ad Allah bin Ijris, excuse me, who said, Shadad bin Aus delivered a sermon to the people. He praised Allah and glorified Him. Then he said, Behold, I heard the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as saying that good with all its details will be in the paradise. And the evil, with all its subtleties, will be in the fire. Behold, entry in the paradise is conditional with noble deed, and the fire is the result of his desires. Whenever a person is forced to face some unpleasant things, and he shows patience over them, it draws him nearer. And when a person is obsessed in vain desires, and he reaches at the verge of hell fire, it drags him to the hell fire, and he becomes worthy of it. So act upon the rights before a day in which judgment is made with truth, and alight on the landing places of the truth. He said, a master related to us from Yazid uh, Asraqashi, from Anas, who said, when the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was taken at night and approached the heaven, and he heard a whispering noise, he said, Jibreel, what is this? He said, it is a stone that has been thrown from one side of the hell, and it hurls on for seventy years, and now it has reached its depth. He said, and Damash related to him from Yazid, from Anas bin Malik, reported the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as saying, Lamentation was brought upon the denizens of the fire, and they wept till the tears were dried up. They again wept till there were notches on their faces. He said, Muhammad bin Ishaq related to me, who said, Ubadullah bin Mugira related to me from Suleiman bin Amir, from Abu Sa'id al-Qudri, radiallahu anhu, who said, I heard the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saying, the Sarat, the bridge, will be erected between two sides of the hell, covered with a prickly hedge like the sedan grass. Then people would cross over it, Muslims will escape, and some would stumble, but would succeed to escape 
others will be confined therein on their faces. And I want to pause here briefly uh, to mention this point that Abu Yusuf Rahimahullah Ta'ala is making about the Sirat. Uh, we all know, uh, I hope inshallah Ta'ala uh, that we know, um, that the Sirat is a bridge that covers the hell, that the people will have to cross over in order to get to the Jannah from the place of the counting. And we see here that Abu Yusuf Rahimahullah Ta'ala is introducing this topic with a series of warnings to the uh, to the Emir al Mukminin. He's introducing this topic with a set of evidences, with a set of, uh, a, a set of hadith uh, that will underpin the arguments he will give after the intro that respond to the specific request the Caliph placed upon him to write to him about the Qaraj, to write to him about the taxation system. But Abu Yusuf uh, Rahimullah has made sure to use authentic narrations to report on the deeper purpose. And the reason that he's doing this is because he knows that at the heart of Islam, at the heart of political reform, of economic reform, of social reform, lies the necessity, of course, that the basic principles of taqwa are first understood. That uh, we understand that every action in the dunya will have consequences uh, on us uh, during the day of judgment. Uh, and uh, that belief in the last day guides all other alterations uh, of reality. So Abu Yusuf, rahimahullah, is writing aggressively to the caliph as if he, the scholar, and not the king, is the true authority. And I want to, again, you should just imagine for a second uh, that the ulama of today wrote and encouraged the kings uh, and the despots of Muslim lands uh, to wage jihad and to reform the society. Can you imagine? Remember, it happened. It happened before um, Bin Laden declared uh, his uh, his jihad. Remember, it happened when they started to speak up in the Arabian Peninsula, when Salman al Auda spoke on Tawheed al Hakimiyah. Remember, it happened, and they put them in prison. They silenced them completely, and it continues to happen. Nasr al Fad, right? It, it continues to happen. Safar al Hawari. These great shayuk that were speaking haq have reformed, they themselves have made islah, islah to the devil, huh? by being reformed in the prisons of the, of the, of the kings uh, of this dunya. Hmm? So what we say is, can you imagine, we would love to see ourselves be able to, as they say, the first thing a salaf, Saudi salafi will say to you, we have to take from the ulama. This is correct. Right? We want to take from the people of knowledge. But what about the person of knowledge that disregards his duty to be a, a, a direct line and link between the political authority and Allah as the Wajal and his messenger? Right? Do we have to take from people like this? And Abu Yusuf here is reminding Harun al-Rashid in the best of ways with Hadith that he must be a righteous man himself if he expects the Ummah will be righteous. And he is telling him about the reform, but he doesn't mention any hadith about governance, any hadith about politics. He hasn't even touched on the subject of taxation yet because he is making sure that the underwriting understanding of anyone that wants to do good in the world is that the fundamentals, the foundations of Islam are established in their own life. That the fundamentals of dhikr of wanting to wage jihad, of being unfearful, of wanting to go out with the army even though you are a person of prestige. He is waging this understanding inside the Caliph's mind. And until the ulama go back to fulfilling its obligation collectively, then this ummah will never be relieved of the great burden that we find ourselves in today. It probably would not go over too well, to say the least, if a scholar was dependent. And if you read the declarations of Sheikh Osama bin Laden, directed to bin Baz directly, and he directed two letters directly to the House of Saud themselves, commenting on the proofs and evidences about their kufr, for making the halal haram and the haram halal, for the riba-based system, for wearing uh, crosses around their neck, you will see that even the ulama have nothing to say in, fight, in spite of the truth that must be established in this day and age. And so why would we refer to ulama that will comment about how we make a stinja, that will comment about how we pray salat correctly, that will pass correct fatwa on the individual matters but have nothing to say. Nothing to say about the atrocities that Muslims undergo every day. You would be halfway foolish to take from them with regard to the political and economic and social realm. 
right? You'd have to be halfway foolish. And I want to give the proof for the fact that you don't have to, right? I want to remark briefly about what he has just re uh, about what he has just informed Harun al Rashid about. He has just told the Caliph of Islam of all the Muslimin about the Sirat. The bridge that people will have to cross to get from plane, the plane of accounting where your deeds will be weighed to the Jannah on the Day of Judgment. And in order to explain it in a better way, I want to read a quote from Ibn Taymiyyah, uh, rahimahullah ta'ala, who describes the belief in this plane and the Sirat beautifully in the work that is most commonly studied by Hanbali's uh, Aqidah to Wasatiya. And uh, Shaykh al-Islam, he says, there will be a held of kawfah in the plane of resurrection. And at it, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will come. Its water will be whiter than milk and sweeter than honey. And there will be cups at it, as many in number as the stars in the sky. Its length can be covered in a month's journey, and so also its breadth. Whoever drinks from it once will never feel thirsty again. The Sirat is laid across the back of hell. It is a bridge between paradise and hell. People will be able to cross it according to their deeds. Some will cross it within the twinkling of an eye. Some will pass like lightning, some like fast wind, some like a speeding horse, and some like riding a camel. Some will cross it running and some walking. Some will be dragged across and some will be just picked up and thrown into hell. There will be hooks on this bridge which will pick up people according to their deeds. One who will cross this bridge will be admitted to paradise. When they will cross it, they will be stopped at the point between hell and paradise, and some will have to give reprisals for some others. When they will become purged from it, they will get the permission to enter paradise, unquote from Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah. So we have a description here in this book uh, by Ibn Taymiyyah, and it's a book on the beliefs and aqidah, as we said, of the victorious sect. So he is describing the aqidah of al-Husun wa jamaat and part of their beliefs is that they believe and that they emphasize two things about the Day of Judgment, the Haud and the Sirat. <coughs> so we know, inshallah, from the tafsir that was given a couple of weeks ago by Sheikh Faisal, that the Haud refers to a river or body of water on the Day of Judgment. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna ta'anaka kawtar, this is what he's talking about. Surely we have given you the fountain, the pool, the Haud, uh, on, for the Day of Judgment. And Allah, uh, and it is narrated by more than 30 companions that this river, this kawtar, is called the Haud, and that people that are able to drink from it will have their thirst quenched for eternity. That they will never be thirsty again if they are able to drink from it. And we know that all the messengers uh, had uh, will have a haud as well. That the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "Inna li kulli nabi haud." There will be a haud for every single prophet on the day of judgment. And we know that some of the companions that were with the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, who fell into disbelief after him, will will come to drink from it, but the angels will prevent them. And that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam will say, "But they were with me. I can verify for them." And the angels will say, "You do not know what they did after you were gone." And so we know that this haud is a very important principle. Um, and Ibn Taymiyyah connects it to the crossing of the Sirat. So he is describing the Haud and the Sirat together. But I think a conversation about the Haud today, uh, verifying what we just said about the ulama, must include some of the authentic hadiths, or hadith with regard to the rulers uh, during the end uh, of time. So it is narrated. And these uh, hadith are very important for us to recognize. Even Sheikh Albani has graded this one that I will read to you now, narrated by Abdullah ibn Umar, uh, who said that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that there will be rulers after me, that whoever believes in their lies and helps them in their oppression and visits them regularly, that he is not from me, nor I from him, and he will never come to my fountain, my held on the day of judgment. And the one who never helped them in their own injustice and doesn't go to their doors, and he, then he is from me, and I am from him, and he will come to my help on the Day of Judgment. So this is a very clear warning, ya Muslimin, about an error when the leaders and the rulers will be corrupt, and those that ally with them will be denied this blessing. So in order for us to not deny ourselves from this blessing, I felt it appropriate to mention that situation and their case here, because it is one that is certainly most... Uh, probably, with the ulama agreed that all of the minor signs of the hour are past, 
then this condition, the rulers being distinguished as reprehensible in the eyes of the Ummah, but yet we still have entire sects of people that say that we should be close to them, that say that we should guide them, that say that we should follow them, that it is important for us to understand the whole of the deen and not some of the deen. Last week we also had a conversation about the condition of the one that rules by others than what Allah Ta'ala has revealed. And we described the hadith that are narrated incessantly by the groups and the likes of these people that point to the fact that if Allah Azza wa Jal puts a ruler over you that is oppressive, then you should obey him, even if he whips your back and other hadith like it. But we mentioned the hadith they never, ever, ever narrate, which is unless you see kufr bawan, unless you see the open kufr from which you have a evidence, from which you have a proof from Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala, then you can rebel against them. So the only way you can rebel is if they have made halal haram, uh, made haram halal, or they have neglected what is clear cut from the matters of the deen, then of course it is permissible to rebel and not follow them. And so we warn those that are listening, no matter what your present opinion is, that there will be a fountain on Yom Qiyamah, that there will be a pool on Yom Qiyamah, and the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will sit at its head, and only those that were with him, and that came after him, and that followed his way, will be able to drink from it. And that those that follow the oppressive tyrants, in order to gain peace and stability in this dunya, and have nothing to say in the face of their aggression and oppression, then they are not from him, and he is not from them, and they will never be allowed to drink from the house. And so we give a reminder before we get overwhelmed in this idea again, warning that this is an example we must understand in history. This is an alim writing to a caliph who is implementing the sharia, and even though he's already implementing the sharia, he wants to improve the condition of the muslimin, and so he is asking the qadi al-qudat, the qadi of the qadis, the judge of the judges, he is asking him for advice, not telling him who to put in prison, not telling him how to twist this fatawa so the American troops can come and enjoy the life in our lands, so that they can establish their military bases, so that they can launch attacks on Iran, attacks on Iraq, attacks on Afghanistan, so that they can launch attacks in 1996. He is not this type of Adam, and it is not that type of leader. So we do not want to get mixed up in suggesting that we must also adopt this position of being gentle with leaders that have been so far corrupted. And that is an important distinction that we want to make, because we are about to engage in conversations of governance. And the only way that we want to involve ourselves in any government that establishes itself is if that government is ruling by the Sharia of Allah and trying to adhere to the way of the Khulafa Rashidin, because any government that takes any other route will be disgraced. And we've already talked about Harun al-Rashid, and the fact that Harun al-Rashid saw it this way, but that uh, directly after him, directly after him, comes the Khulafa, his sons Al-Amin, right? Uh, Al-Amin and Ma'moon, who were deviated from this adherence and desire to seek the way of the Khulafa Rashidin. And so we had the insertion of the ideas of the deviant sects, the Mutazilites. And so we had the situation where Ahmed bin Hanbal, the leader of the Hanbali school, was put and questioned about the createdness of the Qur'an, and was tortured by the Caliph, and was being brought in front of Caliph Makmun. And he was about, he could have killed him, he wanted to actually end his life. But it was the noble du'a of Ahmed ibn Hanbal who made du'a and said, please do not allow this to take place. And in the process of him being transported to him, he passed away. The caliph passed away. But we have to understand, ya Muslimin, that this is the situation. That we are not worried about governmental power, that it is better for us to adhere to poverty and to eating the root of a tree than it is to ally ourselves with the, love, with the leadership and the political people of power and authority when they are not adhering to the rule of the Sahaba and the Salaf and the Khulafa Rashidin. And that is an important point that must be noticed. We are not trying to establish ourselves through democracy. We are not trying to enter ourselves into peaceful elections promoting ex-leaders of the International Atomic Energy Association as the Iqwana Muslimin in Egypt are doing today and denying that they will rule by the Sharia, saying that it is about gradual implementation. We are people from al Sunnah wa Jama'ah. We adhere to the Hudud and we seek to establish the Hudud and the Hudud 
all together at one time, not just a piece of the Hadood for this rich person or for this person, and this is something that must be driven home, and it is something that must be understood, and it is something that must be very, 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 very much a part of your everyday consciousness if you go out and you attempt to create Islam in your society apart from yourself and your family, which is a dawah that many of us uh, have put uh, an obligation or taken upon uh, ourselves. And so uh, we say uh, that this is something we should uh, certainly uh, pay attention to. It's a 300-page book, but we'll start to go short. The good thing is is that it has five to ten-page chapters. It's actually great for adults after we get through the introduction. But we really want to make it beneficial for s future things that Revolution Muslim has planned. And so we're going through the... It is, a, it, it is in old publications, but not in PDF or anything like this. <coughs> so uh, we'll continue, inshallah ta'ala. I just uh, I, I deviated a little bit uh, from the conversation, and we'll read a little bit more of the text, and then we'll wrap up. It's 8.32. So Abu Yusuf rahimahullah ta'ala continues, he said, Said bin Muslim related to me from Amr, Amir, Abdullah bin Zubair from Auf bin Harith, from Aisha radiallahu anha, who reported the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as saying, Aisha, guard yourself against insignificant actions for you will be held accountable for them by Allah. He said, Azib reported, we were with the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in a funeral. When we reached the grave, the Prophet bent down and wept till the earth became wet. He then said, O oh, my brethren, make preparation for a day like this. Ubaid bin Umair said, The grave would say, O oh, son of Adam, what preparation have you made for me? Did you not know that I am the abode of loneliness and the abode of worms and the abode of solitude? Hajrat Abu Harara reported of Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as saying, Allah the mighty and exalted would say, I have prepared for my virtuous servants what no eye has seen and no ear has heard of nor a man perceived of it. You may read if you like. No soul knows what has been concealed for them of the coolness of the eyes as a reward for what they were wont to do. In the paradise there is a tree. A rider would ride under its shade for 100 years, but if the shade would not exhaust. Read if you like, and the length and shadows. The area covered by one whip in the paradise is better than the world and whatever is in it. Read if you like, whoever has been saved from the fire and made to enter the paradise, he has certainly succeeded, and the life of this world is nothing but a provision of deceit. That's the section that we'll end with, because now he is finally going to get, after all of those warnings, he is going to get into the hadith about rulership, and the introduction continues for another uh, approximately 16 pages. Next week there will be very little, little commentary. We will mostly just read uh, through uh, the texts uh, and get through the introduction and then we will begin with the uh, actual establishment uh, of the policies uh, of the Kulaf Rashidin. For those, uh, and as, as narrated and recorded uh, by Abu Yusuf Rahimullah Ta'ala, those uh, people uh, that want to uh, understand more about the work, it was translated, but it was translated uh, only into two edition runs in Pakistan, and a Western scholar, I can't remember his name, translated it into English where you can purchase the text, but it's very expensive because it's, again, out of print, and you'd have to buy it from like a, a university, uh, uh, basically from like a, a university store or <clears throat> someone that uh, sells the rare books. Uh, and so what I'll try to do is uh, find a scanner that's capable of scanning the uh, text, inshallah. Uh, so uh, maybe someone could also try to find the text itself or scan the text and send it to Revolution Muslim. But we have a 30-page introduction, and I know it's somewhat boring to work through all these pages. Uh, but then after that, the chapters tend to be approximately seven to ten pages each. And you have basically specific conversations around specific events. So, for example, you'll have a conversation where Abu Yusuf, rahimahullah ta'ala, will record the policy of when Iraq became merged into the Islamic Empire after... Uh, after uh, after uh, Umar bin al-Khattab uh, conquered the Persians 
and Iraq was absorbed as well, there is a great disagreement over land. The Prophet ﷺ had given land in Khaybar to the Sahaba specifically, especially the Muhajirun, those that made Hijrah from Mecca to Medina. And he gave them the land to do with it what they wanted. So, this, some of the Sahaba tried to use as a proof uh, for Umar bin al-Khattab to take the land of Iraq. But if Sahaba who already had land were given additional land in Iraq, there would be no guarantee that they would really develop it. And so what Omar did was he used different evidences to make Iraq Islamic land and then to use the principles of development to make Islam spread through Iraq. And what happened was over time Iraq became a garrison town that was on the outskirts of the empire and as the empire continued to expand into Syria and north those garrison towns became sort of like thriving merchant places. Uh, we know that Omar bin al-Khattab implemented a policy that made the Mujahideen return home from jihad once every four months to be with their wives and that these outposts were stopping posts so hotels were spent up so that the soldiers, the Mujahideen, could camp there in them on their way back to Mecca, Medina, and the Hejaz, and the Arabian Peninsula to see their families. Hmm? And we know that as a result, this is how this land developed. And that by the time the Abbasids came, the reign of Umar bin al-Khattab and his effective administration had developed these successful agricultural lands, these successful industrial lands, that allowed the Abbasids to make their home, and the home of the Caliphate uh, in Baghdad, and to make it one of the most prosperous, rich, cities that the world has ever known. And so as we read this, we'll get a very live account of the conversations that were had from amongst the Sahaba. How they would bring the Sahaba that were still alive, which were dwindling in number, and going down in number, how they would bring them to make decisions. How Umar bin al-Khattab would refer to the most knowledgeable from amongst them. We will get a historical account of the conquering of Syria. In Syria, the uh, leader of the jihad in Syria, they conquered, but the Byzantines were about to take it back. And they had already collected the jizya, as we said when we read um, Yusuf al uari's book on jihad and the uh, offensive jihad. We, he, they said that they used the proof that the jizya can only be taken once a year as a proof that jihad must continue to expand itself. Well, they had taken the jizya, but they knew they were going to have to relinquish the town. And because jizya is conditional upon the Muslimin being able to protect the people of the book and the Vimmis that are living under them, they returned the jizya in its entirety to them. And the Christians, al Kitab, that lived in Syria, begged, begged them to come back and prayed for the Muslims against the Byzantines. The Byzantine Empire prayed against them, the Byzantines who were Christian like them, that they would be defeated because the rule of the Muslims was so righteous over top of them. So this was the era that, and this is why the Prophet ﷺ said to refer to my sunnah and the sunnah or the way of the Khulifa Rashidin and hold on to it with your molar teeth. Bite on to it with your molar teeth. Because the reign of the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ witnessed a nomadic people, predominantly Bedouin, Right? Enter the fold of Islam. And Islam was not widely accepted from amongst the rich. So some of the most unsophisticated, uneducated, the lower classes of society were the ones that now assume this great position of leadership. Alhamdulillah. That this is the nature of the prophets. Remember Heraclius questioning Abu Sufyan in Sahih Bukhari. The long hadith about the questioning. It, who, who joins him? The wealthy from amongst them or the lowest from amongst them? Predominantly the lowest from amongst them, but some and few and far in between. And this is one of the proofs that verifies to Heraclius that this man is indeed a prophet of Allah. Right? That the lowest follow him. But needless to say, by the time the Abbasids roll around, by the time Omar bin al-Khattab comes, the Khulaf al-Rashidin experienced this progression between the nomadization or the nomadic peoples, the northern and southern tribes of the Arabian Peninsula who formed the initial army of the Muslimin, that these people became urbanized, that they developed cities, that they developed societies, that they developed civilization that was much more advanced technologically, economically, and sophistication. That's why for us as Muslims, we cannot just refer to Allah's Messenger, because we may find ourselves in a time much like Harun al-Rashid. He is at the pinnacle of his power. He is controlling everything from Spain 
all the way into Khorasan, all the way through the Arabian Peninsula. We said that he used to say to the clouds in the morning, O oh, clouds, travel wherever you want. Wherever you drop your rain, the produce will come back to me as zakat. Right? This is how immaculate, how huge the Islamic Emirate was uh, under the reign of Harun al-Rashid. Right? But it was urbanized, it was developed, it was a time of heightened scientific and technological awareness. The proofs from the Khulafa Rashidin are the proofs that he is seeking to use because as we said, the Umayyads came and under Muawiyah and from the time of Muawiyah all the way on up through their 90 year reign, in the end what brought them down was oppressive taxation. Not knowing how to govern and administer in a way that keeps people feeling as though they are not oppressed by the state. As though the boot of the state is not upon them, as though the state is there to develop. And you will see in this book by Abu Yusuf that we will engage in these short discussions about the development of the state. So I, I think with that we'll end today's discussion and we'll open the floor up for questions quickly. The sisters will probably open up their room if they haven't done so already. I didn't get to see all the text on the screen. I, I, I think that there's a, a room if uh, Sister Mujahida is still here, she could post the name of the room if, uh, and what time they'll be starting. Uh, I believe that we will initiate uh, a Sister's uh, Halakha in probably uh, five to ten minutes in another room. So hopefully, inshallah, if there's an admin here, authentic Tawheed Sisters in the Pal Talk Islam section. So any sisters that want to make Hijra, inshallah ta'ala now, may Allah tabarakah wa ta'ala bless you all to guide you and guide us all to a path of increased iman and awareness, to a path of increased interest and dedication to our deen, and to improve us our, in our ibadah, and in our uh, sincerity, our ikhlas, and in our ability to do something with our lives in the way of Allah Azza wa Jal. Um, and uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of course, protect his mujahideen, and those that have the courage in this confusing day and age uh, to go out and to address the munkar in the society, uh, to address it head on and to take it on and to not fear the blame of the blamers and to speak the truth in front of the tyrants uh, and to sacrifice with self and wealth in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may he uh, make it possible for more individuals to rise up to improve the ranks of the members of al Sunnah wa Jama'ah to improve the numbers of the Mujahideen and to give them a beautiful victory inshallah ta'ala over the uh, empire of the world today to knock another notch on the number of empires that we have taken down uh, in the history of this Ummah. And what a beautiful deen it is to be an American Caucasian uh, born and raised in the United States and to be saying such things. Uh, the fold of Islam, Allahu Akbar, uh, you can enter into it on any day when you realize the truth is the truth. And immediately you get 1.5 billion, as they say, which is not, of course, true, we know. But you get a large number of brothers and sisters, all of whom become, no matter what country or color they are, uh, where no matter what country they live in or what color of skin or what ethnic background they hold, they are your partners in a jihad to establish Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala's word on the earth. And we praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for this blessing. And we ask that he extend it to as many other human beings as possible. For surely there is no greater blessing in the world to be a Muslim. We ask that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy on us all and guide us each and every single one of us to the Surat al-Mustaqim. Ameen. Uh, and the floor is open, inshallah ta'ala, for questions or comments or criticisms or concerns. It could be about today's topic or it could be about the general uh, happenings, uh, again, uh, with regard to political uh, an analysis. It's only an opinion, uh, but uh, the most important thing is if you give an opinion that has no fact, that is not tied to any data, is not tied to anything that can be visibly seen or verified, then you have just stated an opinion. If you give an opinion, however, that is backed by proofs and evidences, then there can be established a truth in this dunya. And Allah says, verily, the truth comes in, it shatters the falsehood. And so we should be people that can use our aql and to fulfill the ayat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala where he says that it is I who have sent my messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with the deen of truth so that it may dominate over all the deens. And the ulama agree that it does not just dominate with the fists, that it dominates in every aspect with regard to its ability. The sharia is superior to their systems and it dominates over all uh, other deens. So we ask that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to verbally express that. And in regard to political or economic or current affair analysis, that he allow us to humiliate and establish the haq. 
so that we can defend the honor of the Mujahideen with evidences that can be verified, not just with rhetoric and incessant ramblings about things of which we cannot refer to data or proof for. Verily, this is the difference between the person who speaks and knows and the one who speaks just what comes to his head with no verification available. Inshallah ta'ala, we ask that uh, Allah make it easy on each and every single one of us to see the truth, to separate the truth from the falsehood, and that he make us all uh, increasing every day in our knowledge of the affairs of the deen and actually, in reality, the affairs of the dunya too, so that we can establish a just uh, way of life for all the Muslims all over the world. Inshallah ta'ala, I mean. Four is open for questions. Uh, we'll wait about two minutes. If there's none, we'll close, inshallah. All sisters should be moving or should have already moved at this point. Uh, the letter given, here's a question, I didn't see it. Okay, let me say the room, the room name is something sisters. <laughs> I'm sorry, I forgot it. My memory is bad. The room name is Authentic Tawheed Sisters. It's in the Islam section on Pal Talk. All the sisters should go to that room for their halakha, inshallah. Question from testing one two three one two three. The letter given to Harun al Rashid. Did Abu Yusuf give it voluntarily or upon being asked by Harun al Rashid? He wrote the treatise. Uh, if you listen to the first two lectures, we talked about that. Someone asked, you know, what we would say in today's reality. You know, why Abu Yusuf would take a position for the government, right? And we'd say that there was a quantitative and qualitative difference between Harun al Rashid the caliph of the Abbasids, in that he was going to the scholar. Right? So the hadith that are narrated are numerous, but there is many, 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 many a hadith about the one that goes to the scholar. Right? Or the, the scholar that goes to the gates of the rulers. So Abdullah ibn Abbas said uh, that Allah's Messenger وسلم, narrated that there shall be uh, rulers whom you will recognize from them good and evil, whoever opposes them is saved, whoever abandons them is freed, and whoever intermingles with them is destroyed. Uh, and uh, uh, Ibn Abbas, uh, there's another hadith from Ibn Abbas about the, the, the reciters of the Quran, I can't remember it. Um, but we know that the, there's many a hadith about the ruler or the scholar that you find at the gate. Do not take from the scholar who is found at the uh, gates of the ruler, right? And there's several a hadith about this fact. Well, Harun al-Rashid is someone that is going to the ulama because he is as taqwa. He has a kingdom. And he knows that there are some deviations. So he is asking about the taxation system that he has inherited from other people before him that were righteous to the most degree. The errors of the Abbasids and the Mutazilite creed did not creep in to the Abbasidian rule. And Ibn Khaldun says very clearly that it is for the, he doesn't say it's for this reason, but he says very clearly that Harun al-Rashid marks the last caliph that actually held physical authority in the earth. That after this, the Abbasids, what they did was they declined. And they declined to the point where they were caliph and the Amir was the Amir of in name only. They had no real physical power. Even under the Mamluks, the Seljuks, and those that would come after them for about a hundred year period of time, they were under the Buwahids, who were essentially Shias. But they did, that they still had the caliphate, they still had Baghdad, they still had the Amir of Mu'minin, but he had no real power. And this is because they deviated from the way of the Sunnah wa Jama'ah. This is because they deviated. Well, Harun al-Rashid is making an effort here to go to the uh, scholar. And Abu Yusuf is writing it to him after he's requested. And the fact that he wrote it down means that he didn't go to the palace to give it to him himself. So he didn't go to deliver it with his verbal. He wrote it. He had it uh, written and recorded so that it could be delivered. Right, from a distance. So this is a very different situation, but we said in the first week, you can listen to the transcript if you want, uh, we said very clearly uh, that, um, that this uh, situation is, uh, is very different uh, from uh, the time today and the time now. That under even a modern Islamic state, if we were to establish the Sharia, we would separate the ulama from the governing affairs. That people would specialize in government, in economics, in society, in welfare cases, in infrastructure development, in engineering, in all different components of physical government. People would specialize in that. And that the ulama would serve as a class whereby things that were questionable would be put to them. That the governing body would refer to them much in the manner, I hate to say and make the analogy, but much in the way that the Supreme Court works in the United States. 
in that anything that is unconstitutional or anything that is questionable goes to the Supreme Court where they can decipher and deci decide whether or not a case uh, is constitutionally correct. For example, this week they had a case about the Patriot Act and a derivative of the Patriot Act, a definition of what it means to provide, provide material support for the terrorists or material support for terrorist groups. And they deliberated and uh, you can't even provide advice. So you can't even write a policy document to be used by the PKK in Turkey or by any terrorist group that might bring conflict resolution and peace. This in and of itself is also re, uh, forbidden because it is a form of material support, which makes it uh, basically applicable to anybody that would want to say, let's suggest that Al-Qaeda should do such and such in order to bring peace to and an end to the war on terror or something like this. You know, so that's the way that their scholarly class rules with the Constitution. Our scholarly classes would rule uh, in much the same manner in that they would stay focused on the dean, but specific cases would be put to them, and they would rule on them. In this situation, you have the specific case of Harun al-Rashid, and you have to understand that the Abbasids are aware that anybody that looks at the taxation policy of the Abbasids knows that they've inherited a system that has to be changed because from the Umayyads, uh, the reason that they were successful in their revolt against them was a taxation policy, but it's a time of renewal, it's a time of reform. It is a time when there is, by necessity, policy that needs changed. So you can change it with your own aqua, and Harun al-Rashid has knowledge himself. He was very knowledgeable. But why would you do that when you have an Adam like Abu Yusuf, who learned from Abu Hanifa, who learned from Imam Malik, who learned from major, major, major ulema, right? And was in his own right walking, you know, talking, uh, legitimately one of the most amazing atoms that ever walked the face of the earth. So why would you not ask him to answer the question? But it's the way that he answered the question that's so miraculous because instead of just recording hadith, uh, rather than just recording, you know, statements of the Prophet, he did, but he does it in a way that narrates the history of the Kulif al-Rashidin. So he does it in a very, very, very historical and in, in a way uh, with fiqh. And in a way of narrating hadith, he was known for his strength in narrating of hadith. We talked about that too. You can listen to the evidences for that in the first lecture or the second lecture. So, um, that's it. Um, Brother Yunus, will you be giving a session on current events? I'm trying to. It's very hard for me. Uh, it's summertime. Uh, we have a lot of things going on with the family and work. And I have a commute of uh, two and a half hours each day right now on the trains. So I usually used to do those on Thursdays. And, uh, and it's just been impossible for me to get home. But uh, I want to. Or wallahi, I do. Uh, but I don't like to speak uh, about things that can just be easily ascertained by looking at revolutionmuslim.com. Right? So I don't just want to reiterate what other people have done. Hmm? I want to be able to give a discussion around specific events and occurrences when there's something that is significant to say from an RM perspective. But I think what I'm going to have to do is just get on uh, because, the, you know, I do spend the majority of my day studying, of course, you know, my specialty is not the dean of fiqh or anything like this. I study economics and uh, political realities and specialize in social movement uh, and in, uh, in, 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 in activism itself. And so, uh, you know, I do stay up to date, and I should uh, just get on, I think, and just have open-ended conversations. But I'm not so sure anybody would come to the circle with questions uh, that are important to them. So we may try it this Thursday, inshallah. Uh, but I may just continue to focus on Kitab al-Karaj for now, because we have Omar Bakri speaking in here. We have Abdullah Faisal speaking in here. And the current events are posted on RM. We post most of the important, relevant uh, news that allows you to use your own brain to sort of expound on uh, realities. And uh, inshallah, we might do Thursdays, but I'm still up in the air. I like this setup they have going on in Authentic Tawheed. I think uh, I can't get home to hear Faisal because I'm on the train. But I like the idea of him being available every day for the Muslimin. And then with Omar Bakri, we'll try to get Anjim Shoundry in here. We had a confirmation uh, from Anjim. Uh, but not possible. And I think what we should do is we should try to contact Sheikh Fuzz and see where he is with his um, with his studies. I think he should be graduating very soon. So those of you that know Sheikh Fuzz and know how to get a hold of him should work on it. 
uh, I'm sure we can get through to him as well. I don't know if the lectures are being recorded. I think they're recorded, but they're waiting to be uploaded. Anyway, uh, is there any other questions in, in the room, inshallah? Yes, it is. Uh, there's a lot of rumors. Uh, sometimes when people get letters from uh, Shayuk of the Mujahideen, they start to think that they're the only ones uh, transmitting the information of the Mujahideen. And uh, so lately there's been a lot of threads about how this uh, site is not authentic or whatnot. Uh, but, uh, you know, we have to understand something. There's a clear distinction that has to be made. There's many, 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 many people that are waging jihad in the earth right now uh, that uh, have their own opinions. There is no one monolithic opinion from amongst Mujahideen. The unjust media has contacts with, ver with members of Taliban. There's no doubt about this, and it's valuable when that they can give you direct interviews on the positions of people with the Taliban. For example, Rupert Murdoch's paper, The Telegraph, published a report that Mullah Omar had agreed to have conversations with uh, Hamid Karzai. The unjust media were able to immediately contact someone uh, in Kandahar who denied the report, right? And it was uh, verifiable. It was truth. Mm -hmm. And they post a lot of... They take a... Uh, there's, there's other people... Uh, that take the position that you should not toast the news of the kufar. So they take the hadith, or, or the ayah, that says if a fasik comes to you with news, then verify it. And so they call and they write and they uh, email Revolution Muslim and they say, why do you post progressive news? Why do you post Noam Chomsky? Why do you post these people who are kufar? Uh, and their political analysis, lies as well says to verify it. Well, the answer is we did verify it, and what they say is true. Hmm? So now what? Uh, can we use it? Uh, the principle in Islam is to take the truth, even if it's from a liar. So we have the hadith of Abu Hurairah, who was told by the shaitan, if he recites ayat of curse over his wealth, right, then it will be protected. And he went and he told Rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he said, verily, he has told you the truth, even though he is a liar. Hmm? So what happens when you verify the truth of a person who is not in the fold of Islam, who is a kafir, and then you want to use it? It's permissible. Well, the unjust media falls into accusations for the same thing. They post a lot of the information from the Mujahideen, but in a way that I think is very wise, uh, what they do also, what they do also is they post a very important, and I think they do a good job of surfing through relevant uh, articles that are very much along the lines. Listen, this deen, this ummah, this jihad will never be successful. It will never be successful on a worldwide global basis until we have a view of the world that we can sell to the citizens of the world, until we have a system that can show and rid the deception of the Dajjal and the Shaitan and the Shayateen, until we have a system that we can say that this is what Islam will look like in 2011, in 2010, that, it's, that this is how Islam takes the definition you have of women, which is oppressive. This is how it liberates the woman, because we love our women for the sake of their brains, for the development of their wives. But we have to stop saying that in rhetoric in Dawah, and we have to make that the reality. We have to make our understanding that a woman's place is in the home, we have to make it sincere. We have to make an understanding that the woman is liberated, and that the woman is free to be in the home, and that the woman is also able to work under Sharia if... If we need hospitals, we need police women, we need different situations, there's not a catch-all phrase, right? But we do have a system that is Islamic. And anywhere it disagrees with the Kufr system, then it dominates. It's superior. The Prophet ﷺ said that this deen it dominates and it is never dominated. It is superior and, is never, and there is nothing superior over it. What we have to do is we have to reconcile the deen and we have to make the deen something that is emancipatory. It has to be a liberation. The deen came to liberate the people. What did the, they say to Sisera and the, uh, to the, the general of the Persians? What, what did they say to him? 
What have you come to us for with this jihad? Offensive jihad, telling us you're going to conquer us. What have you come to us with this for? Hmm? Verily, we have come to take you away from the worship of men and to free you, to liberate you to the worship of the one God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is what the worship of Allah does. In the Sharia is not the punishment. The Sharia is like it means linguistically. It is a fountain. It is a water hole that the animals come to drink at. It gives you, it, it, it quenches your thirst for justice. It establishes justice on the earth. And so that's what we have got to do. And there are many people that using their akl, they arrive at systems of principles of governance that are just. Hmm? For example, the anarchists believe that the people that work in the factories should own the factories. Guess what? This is a musharaka agreement. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam gave the people that made hijrah from Mecca to Medina. He did not give them wage and did not give them jobs. The Ansar they gave the Muslims that made hijrah. They gave them a share in the yield, a portion of the profit. There's many, many examples. We could go on at the lecture in and of itself. But we need to liberate this world with Allah's Wajal's Hakimiyah. We cannot just establish it with the sword and be brutes. Right? So when it comes to organizations like Unjust Media and when it comes to people that have this very hard, firm, I am a jihadi, and only sources from the verified Mujahideen are acceptable, then we run into problems because the Prophet ﷺ said that gentleness does not enter in a situation but that it beautifies it. Right? And our obligation is to be firm against those that are enemies against us. But Allah says there is no harm in taking friendship from those that have not cast you out of your homes, that do not oppress you. So this is something that we have to, we have to be more balanced. We cannot be extreme with our wala and bara. We have to make bara against the talhut. When a socialist comes to you and they believe that women should walk around half naked and half dressed, you should be able to say this is wrong, but you should be able to rationally give a justification for it. Because Allah does not give a sharia law that does a part of the sharia or something in the sharia. It is not oppressive. Allah gives the things. He says that the reason the women cover is what? So that they can be protected. So we tell them about the number of women that are raped in the West. We show them the rank of the use of the plastic surgery and the Botox. We show them the levels of depression. We show them how the women are um, uh, bulimic and anorexic because they believe that they should only weigh 120 pounds. How they suffer from low self-esteem. How they don't get to pay of the men. But in order to point to something that is legitimate, we have to establish an Islamic community that does not behave in the same way. So my wife told me yesterday the number one use of Botox in the world was not American women. It was Lebanese women. How can we tell American women they're sick for using Botox and plastic surgery when the Lebanese, one out of every three women, has Botox on her lips or her breasts? Something like this, right? It's a joke. This is what we have to, uh, to work on, inshallah. What advice uh, do you have for the Muslim youth who are falling victim to entrapment by agents of the West, pausing as fellow jihadis, sometimes even inciting them? This is a topic that I will address, inshallah ta'ala, it will be recorded, uh, we'll be uh, giving a conversation, inshallah ta'ala, this week on the entrapment of the FBI community on behalf of Brother Tariq Mahanda, inshallah. Uh, so you can check Revolution Muslim. Basically, I'll tell you that the cases are getting enormous. Uh, the actual purpose of it is to protect what has become a budding industry. There's a joint terror task force, which is a coalition of enforcement agencies all across America, all across the world for that matter, which is a trillion, probably a trillion dollar industry by now, and unless they produce arrests, then there will be no more need for the government to fund them. So they have become another form of private power that the government needs to feed in order to prevent unemployment numbers from going up, in order to create jobs. It's just like the military. Imagine the number of people that would be unemployed right now if America were not embroiled in wars overseas. Right? And so the same thing is true for the security complex. Dwight D. Eisenhower mentioned the military industrial establishment and how it was a threat to democracy. Well, we can say that the military industrial national security establishment today is the biggest threat to democracy because the national security establishment is in and of itself becoming a major industry. And that's why you have this incitement. But brothers and sisters should not be so foolish to fall for the tricks and the plots of the plotters. You have to verify that your brother is indeed your brother before you say anything. And we should, ver we should know that rhetoric it means nothing. Allah says, why do you say that which you do not do? 
So why do you tell and say what you're going to do, what you want to do, when you haven't done it yet? This is a foolishness and a trick from the shaitan. Hmm? Allah's Messenger was commanded to incite the believers to fight. Verily, you will not be brought to account but for yourself. And so incitement is part of the deen. Incitement is from the deen. But the problem is that there's a hikmah in every situation. And the Muslims need to learn that these are the common tactics. So our obligation for the youth is to teach them, to teach them how to identify, to teach them the number of cases that have been brought. There's more than 30 cases now brought with the primary witness being an FBI informant where there was no means, there was no ability to engage in the alleged terrorist act because the individual could not have attained the weapons, could not have attained the funding, could not have made it possible were it not for the assistance of an FBI informant who was inciting, who was entrapping along the way. But they don't understand entrapment. You do not have to prove that you, the, you, it was not, that's not a proof that I couldn't have done it were it not for the FBI. The only thing entrapment has to prove is it has a subjective proof and an objective proof. A subjective proof means that you have to prove in a defense of entrapment that the individual that was entrapped by the FBI Right? Would not have committed the act. That's why you see their indictments floated, covered in words about their watching jihadi videos, their love for Osama bin Laden more than they love themselves. This rhetoric. Hmm? Talking to people they've only known for a few days. There are certain cases where they knew the people their whole lives, and then how can you blame them? If a Muslim, because he gets himself in trouble, goes and turns on his own brother and becomes the primary witness in a case, and the brother just says, look, I'm going overseas because I want to train or something like this, then how can you blame a person for falling into this trick because he trusts his brother whom he's known for 20 years? But there's other cases. There's other cases where there's situations where people just meet on the street. Hmm? And then all of a sudden they want to tell them about what they want to do and how they like to kill people and, you know, this, this Ya Muslimin must be identified for what it is. It is unintelligence. And the believer is not bitten by the same hole twice. So there should have been one case, and that should have been the last of it. Hmm? But we know that they will continue to come up with and concoct ways to make us look like terrorists. You will you probably see Brother Eunice on TV one day, uh, and all the grimy stuff that he said, you know, uh, taken out of context from these lectures. Yes. Yes, that's entrapment. We shouldn't trust them. There's no point to talk about jihad here. Hmm? There's no point to talk. Hmm? We can educate the fiqh of jihad. Sheikh Faisal will give good lectures. Hmm? We can talk and make aware in our communities the righteous establishment of the deen and the sharia by the groups that are fighting. It's a permissible. We should educate about the actuality of Somalia, of Afghanistan, of Iraq. We should defend the honor of the Mujahideen with hikmah. Not just with, I hate these kufar, I'd like to take them all captive. There are people that walk around like this. I've known brothers that have walked around and looked at women dressed completely haram, and they'll say, wow, look at her. Hmm? Oh, she'd make a great concubine. Hmm? Wallahi. This is what happens. Right? And it's not even about action, because as Sheikh Faisal said, SubhanAllah, you have a situation where you don't have to go and work on taking yourself to the jihad. If you practice Islam, then they will bring the jihad to you. And that's something we have to remember, that Allah Azza wa Jal makes our hukum. So if we talk all the time about we're going to be real, we're going to go fight, we're going to do this, we're going to do that, right? This is a form of pride. Because what we need to be doing is we need, if we really want to fight and fulfill the obligation that the Prophet ﷺ has set forth, that he who dies without wishing to engage in jihad dies on a branch of hypocrisy. Hmm? Well, this is the conversation then that needs to be held with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you want to talk about how much you want to go fight, Talk to Allah about it. And if you want to proof about the reality, look at Abu Dujanna. And look at the life of Abu Dujanna. 
People say all the time, Eunice, all you are is you just talk rhetoric. We have a reputation, thanks to CNN, about uh, not being courageous to fight ourselves, but inciting others to fight. Well, lie, our, our intention is not to incite the people to fight, per se. What we mean by engaging jihad is jihad with the self, jihad with the tongue, and jihad with the weapon. But what we think for Western Muslims is that they need to command the good and forbid the evil and to deny and reject the ta'ud and to get the Muslims to rise up and to have the courage to say, even if you take our jobs, we will not stand for you putting our innocent brothers and sisters in prison no more. That we will not stand for your foreign policy. That we will not pay your taxes. That we will not do this. That we will not do that. That's what we call to. That's what we've always called to. That Muslims in the West, because listen, if one of us leave, if all of Revolution Muslim crew leaves, there's still Muslims in the West. There's still a hukum for the Muslim. What it, can he do? There's still a reality. So if you leave a body of work behind, then others will pick up on it. You will be replaced. Don't think you're so special. Yunus Abdullah Muhammad must not think that be, because he's uh, speaking on economics and politics, that if I die tomorrow, nobody else will rise up and speak about these topics. Wallahi, that's not the way the Ummah works. Right? You do the best you can with what you have. And the benefit that we have living in the West is freedom of speech, so why don't we use it? Why don't we develop the thoughts, the stream of thoughts, the, the, the vision for the world that would, we would want to live under? Because ideas are very powerful. Ideas never die. La ilaha illallah, Muhammadan Rasulullah never will die. We will die. The Mujahideen will die. The people that stand for the truth will die. But the idea, la ilaha illallah, is eternal. It is until Yom Al-Qiyam. And the judgment and the victory is already promised. So it doesn't matter. Like I say, there's messengers have no followers. You think that the success of your message is what you judge? You think the messengers will be uh, judged by how many people are around them, are with them on Yom Al-Qiyam? There will be messengers without any followers. Nobody listen to them. Nobody listened to their message. They didn't accept La ilaha illallah. Hmm? Where will they be? Are they going to Jahannam because they don't have the Ummah of Muhammad? They go to Jannah, Audhu Billah. Right? Because they convey. Your duty is just to convey. Your duty is to do and to speak only on what you know. Not to get arrogant and think you're, you have all the answers. Not to think you're master this. But if you know something, you have a right to share it. You have a right to spread it. Hmm? And if someone says something wrong, then you say to your brother, brother, you've said something wrong I don't agree with. And alhamdulillah, if it's iktilaf, it might engage you in a very interesting discussion. Too often or not, we want to be fighting. Look at Omar Bakri Muhammad. People say, his menhaj is not jihad, it's seeking nusra. I agree with this. I have had a, a back and forth debate with brothers about the menhaj of seeking nusra versus menhaj of jihad. At the end of the day, it's iktilaf. Right? And I love Omar Bakri and I love the brother who I go back and forth with. And we are very good friends. I love him. Right? And we've had public, I guess you could call it argumentation. Hmm? But these differences are beautiful. But what we do is we make, if you want to fight, if you want to fight every Muslim that's sincere, he wants to fight. But we don't need people screaming about it. Hmm? It's okay to incite the believers to fight, to tell them of the enemy. The Prophet ﷺ went to the hill in Mecca and he called the people, Abu Lahab, hmm? call people, come. If I were to tell you that there was an army coming behind me, would you not believe me? Yes, uh, oh nephew, we would believe you. You are the most righteous from amongst us. Right? And he tells him of La ilaha illallah, and Abu Lahab curses him. And Allah Azza wa Jalla makes takfir, and Abu Lahab and curses him to the hellfire with his wife forever. Forever. So because the Quraysh, they don't believe Allah Azza wa Jalla's wahi is from Allah, they believe it's from the Prophet. So look at, if you believe that the Prophet وسلم, is cursing somebody, calling someone Abu Lahab, the father of the flame, who is known as the most notorious, rich, prominent person in the society, and he's cursing him and telling him that he's going to be in the hellfire, right? And then they tell you your da'wah is too aggressive. Listen, subhanAllah, they must not see. Your da'wah, you can be very firm, because Allah has commanded that we're firm with the disbelievers, that we're kind and compassionate to the believers. And when the believers are asleep, we have to wake them up and jar them. That's why I don't have any problem with the menhaj of Dawa on the street calling to the haq, waking people up, shuttering them, giving them access to the website, calling them to listen in to Sheikh Faisal's dars, etc., etc. And now that you know where he is, you can do that in your own community. You can develop your own flyers and tell people to listen to authentic tawheed. You can hand out recorded lectures of Sheikh Faisal's dars yourself on CD, just like we have done in Revolution Muslim. 
Anybody can become a public day. You can tell them about the current affairs that are going on in Somalia. You can tell them about the Shabab. You can tell them that America had no problem with them in, with Somalia until they established the Sharia. That BBC came in and that they showed the people selling places and agriculture in the marketplace and the women weren't afraid to go out of their homes in Mogadishu anymore. And that, that it's only then that the uh, enemies of Islam decided to attack them. So we say to the people that we need to be smart people. We live in very difficult times. You do not want to bring a fitna into your house just because you want to radicalize someone. Just because you want to make sure that somebody that you know knows you're a jihadi. Knows that everybody else is a deviant. Knows that you would fight if you were given opportunity to. Wallahi, your nonverbal behavior should convey the fact that you are not soft in Islam. So I hope uh, that answered. I guess I went off on a ramble again. Sorry. May Allah forgive me if I said anything wrong. Uh, I apologize uh, if uh, I went off a little bit. It's I think uh, that pretty much ends it. Is there any more uh, questions, or comments, or concerns, or criticisms? Alhamdulillah, 200 people, subhanAllah. In Nigeria, they love the Sheikh. When he was in Nigeria and we were taking care of uh, administering the Dawah, they would call us all the time. All the time. We just heard the best thing we've heard in our life. <laughs> Emails left and right. Do you have any CDs you could send? <laughs> Everybody. They loved him. Wallahi, they loved him, especially after he destroyed that Salafi guy, the Saudi Salafi, subhanAllah. Yes, inshallah. He is a good sheikh because he makes it interesting. He keeps your attention and he's very good. He's very good. And uh, he's a good person. A good person and so sincere. Uh, and uh, the beautiful thing about uh, Sheikh Faisal is he doesn't fear the blame of the blamers. Abu Qatada and all the big uh, people came to refute him. And the good thing is, is that he held a belief in his heart and he knew what he was talking about because he had interacted with them. Uh, he had known them. He did know, and they were saying that Allah's Hakimiyah is not a bidda just in that separating it and making it a branch in and of itself is a bidda. That's what they're upon now. But at that time, they said that it was not part of Tawheed. And he was correct. Because if you deny Allah's Hakimiyah, then you do deny no different than the one that bows down to an idol. It is a pillar of a Tawheed. Whether you put it under Uluhiyya or bring it out in and of itself. And he held to his guns. And he was not talking about all Saudi Salafis. He's talking about the ones that had the Hujjah established upon them. And we think he was correct. And uh, we love the Sheikh because he holds his guns and he doesn't care about the big name. And he doesn't care about the, uh, the criticisms and the blame of the blamer. And this is one of the reasons that he should be loved. Because he has his opinions. And again, there are things that... Uh, maybe you don't agree with Sheikh Faisal, but he's a good brother uh, on uh, things, and the things that you disagree with him on are going to be so minor. Uh, we don't have this attitude of if 99% of what a person says we agree with is correct. Uh, if 99% of what a person says we agree with, we uh, look at the 1% we don't agree with and then don't listen to him. And there's people that have come in this room, I've seen them myself, they PM me. Well, Sheikh Faisal said this. What do you think about this? I think that's his opinion. It's a, bit, it's a good, legitimate opinion. If you find out that Sheikh Faisal said such and such, you'll find that Adam, you know, or Mufti, or, you know, uh, Sheikh al-Islam, or someone with credentials also said it because he does not speak of his own desires. He always tells you, Imam Shafi said this, and this is my opinion. You want to argue with Imam Shafi? Because that's who you're arguing with if you argue with the position of Sheikh Faisal that it's permissible for you to get paid to teach the Quran, right? Is one he just answered before he left the microphone. Hmm? I'm sure there's people that say, Ah, oh, billah, this is deviancy, right? And I'm sure there's people that disagree with it. So they won't listen. Maybe some of these people, they won't listen to him anymore. That's it. That's it. And this is the extremism that makes the Islam sour. Hmm? So we love him, and we ask that Allah Azza wa Jal keep him alive for a very long time, and place him in the Jannah Firdaus, and allow him to die on the battlefield in Jihad. Fi sabilillah, inshaAllah ta'ala. Ameen. Any other questions or crim 
comments or concerns, I will relinquish the microphone in two minutes if there's no more questions at 9, 9.21 my time. At 9.23, I'll let go of the mic. Uh, and uh, perhaps uh, either bot uh, could go on. That bot, the system is very nice, uh, admins. Uh, the brother of Abdullah gave me access and let me uh, try it. It's very nice, alhamdulillah. Very good. Uh, there's uh, a couple, Afghan Munda. Yeah. So we end with the dua very quickly. Inshallah ta'ala, we ask that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala again protect his mujahideen, may he give them victory, inshallah ta'ala, over their enemies. Ameen. May he rise up a class of ulama that are courageous and courageous enough not only to speak the truth but to make hijrah to a place and a sanctuary once there it is established so that they have the freedom to write and to speak the truth so that we may benefit from having scholars that can convey for us the true religion. I mean, uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward all of the admins uh, that are associated with authentic tawheed. It's a lot of work. Uh, this uh, room is now open 24-7 uh, and uh, they have put forth a lot of effort and uh, inshallah ta'ala uh, he make it easy on them and allow every uh, key uh, board uh, key that they press to serve as a, a reward for them on Yom Qiyam, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, I mean, uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward uh, all those that sit in the circle where Allah's name is mentioned and praised. Uh, and may he uh, grant to those of us that sat for today's discussion uh, about Abu Yusuf's book, Kitab al-Qaraj, uh, the reward of that which he promised those that sit in the circles and mention Allah's name and praise him or seek um, information about Allah and His Messenger, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. May Allah subhanahu wa taala allow us all to drink from the held of the Prophet, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. May He may grant us a safe passage over the Sirat, entrance into Jannah immediately, so that we do not have to suffer even a portion of time in the hellfire. May He keep us all free of it. Allow us to die in a state of jihad, fi sabilillah. Uh, make sure that uh, all of our uh, hearts are cleansed. Uh, may He grant us the ability to separate uh, falsehood uh, and see the truth. Uh, may He allow our lives and what we leave behind to benefit us even after we die with the establishing uh, in each and every single one of our homes righteous children um, with the ability of us uh, to convey a knowledge that is preserved uh, and to uh, become uh, lights of knowledge in and of ourselves, at least with the implementation of what is agreed upon in this deen. May he allow us all to leave behind a legacy of uh, helping to establish victory for the Muslimin. I mean, uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow each and every single one of us to come back uh, every day to listen to Sheikh Faisal's lectures or to spend a little bit of time at least in each day uh, here in Authentic Tawheed and Pow Talk to benefit from the knowledge of either Omar Bakri, uh, Hafidullah, uh, and uh, Shaykh Abdullah al-Faisal, Hafidullah, uh, so that uh, we can increase our knowledge, inshallah ta'ala, ameen. Uh, this is Yunus Abdullah Muhammad from RevolutionMuslim.com. Um, we hope uh, that you'll join us uh, on Sunday, again next week, uh, at around 8 o'clock p.m. when Shaykh Faisal is done with his tafsir for another uh, conversation around Abu Yusuf's book, Kitab al-Qaraj. We'd like to see the numbers increase on Fridays at 11 p.m. I think the time is difficult for the brothers in the U.K. because it's like 4 a.m. overseas. But the brother Abu Najm Muhammad gives a very good class and a conversation around Imam Dahabi's book, uh, Kitab al-Arsh. Uh, and it is very, uh, very nice work. Uh, he also uh, includes some commentary. And uh, we'd like to see the numbers increase. Uh, for those conversations. Those are, that's on Fridays at 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. That's 4 a.m. UK. And he will start to archive the uh, lectures. And we pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect our dear brother Abu Najm, uh, keep him alive, and uh, grant him an increase in knowledge, uh, grant him a photographic memory so that he re 